the lessons that I've been uh, presenting have focused on Jesus as the master teacher. I was thinking, you know, at, when I when I began this this group of lessons, that it's always important that first of all that we come back to Jesus when we uh, look at our study in the Word. Sometimes it's easy for us to forget to do that. You know, particularly like last year, you know, when we did an, a survey of the entire Bible from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And Jesus, as a person, only figures in a part of that, a fairly small part of that entire scope. He's in it throughout, of course. In terms of the person of Jesus, he's only present in a little bit of that book. And so I thought it was important for us to come back and, and, and re-see Jesus in, in, in the course of a few lessons. And I chose the theme of Jesus as, as teacher because that's one of the places where we often forget to look at Jesus. As weird as that sounds. You know, it's easy for us to remember, as we do every week when we partake of the Lord's Supper, as we've just done, it's easy for us to focus on uh, Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins, Jesus as the instrument of God's grace toward us, Jesus as the hope of our resurrection. It's easy for us to focus on those things because we focus on them every week. And of course it's easy for us to think about Jesus in terms of the miraculous power that he demonstrated because that is something that we find very impressive uh, when we look at the life and work of Jesus in terms of his, his personal work and ministry during the time that he was physically present on earth. But it was interesting in the, in the passage that John read this morning at the Lord's table to note that when Jesus' own disciples thought about him and when they talked about him and when they addressed him, they used the word teacher. They addressed him as rabbi or teacher. And when they were going to prepare for the Passover feast, they were to tell the, the individual who owned the house, the teacher is coming to your house to celebrate the Passover. And so that was how his disciples who, who lived with him and surrounded him, that's how they thought of him because they were constantly listening to him teaching them. And so I think it's important for us to come back for, from time to time and and focus on Jesus as a teacher. But as we've seen during the course of the lessons prior to this, Jesus as teacher is always Jesus as a sermon giver. Because he taught in a lot of different ways. In fact, the two weeks ago we saw a lesson in which Jesus taught without really teaching at all. Using circumstances to teach lessons rather than actually uh, sitting down with people or standing in front of people and teaching in the way that we normally think of that. And we're going to see something like that in a, in a similar way today. We're going to see Jesus teaching through healing. We're going to see how Jesus being the great physician revealed him as the master teacher. And we're going to look specifically at three instances in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 8 and 9, we're going to look at three instances in those two chapters that, that demonstrate this to us. Go ahead, uh, Nathaniel, and put the first slide up for me, please. The first story we're going to look at is at the very beginning of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew records this. He says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, before we go on, I want us to talk just 
a brief moment about this leprosy thing. Because it's not something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we certainly have become very cognizant of dealing with contagious diseases over the course of the last couple of years, have we not? We, we certainly have, have, have probably learned more than we ever wanted to know about the spread of contagious diseases. Well, leprosy, or as it's called today in the scientific literature, Hansen's disease, is a contagious disease that was very common in the first century and in times prior to that. It was so common, in fact, that there were portions of the Law of Moses that actually related to how people who had it were to be dealt with and how they were to conduct themselves and to separate themselves from other people so that they didn't pass on this particular disease. Hansen's disease or leprosy affects the, the, the nervous system. And the way that that often manifests itself is in the deterioration of parts of the body. Starting with the skin, but also moving even deeper into, uh, into the flesh, even to affecting bone. And of course, the, you know, the stereotypical thing that we think about with a person with leprosy, you know, losing uh, parts of their body, the you know fingers and toes and 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 limbs and so forth, as that degenerative disease takes over and and continues its process. In those days, there was no cure for leprosy, and because it was contagious and had no cure, people who had it had to be ostracized, had to be separated from other people because they had this terrible thing. And other people could get it from them if they got too close to them. And so people who had leprosy lived very miserable lives, not only because of the disease that they had, but because of the, 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 the social separation that was required under the law because of the disease that they had. And so when Jesus encounters this individual... This man who, who came and had leprosy, it's interesting to see the way that Jesus interacts with him and uses this very simple circumstance to teach a lesson specifically about grace. Because the man with leprosy demonstrated that he understood what grace was. He approaches Jesus, no doubt from a social distance, as we would say that in the parlance of our day, but approaches Jesus close enough for Jesus to be able to speak with him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Right there in that phrase, if you are willing, we see that this man had an understanding of grace. Because grace is something that we can define as a positive gift that is undeserved by the one who receives it. Grace is not something you can demand. Grace is not something that you can insist upon. Grace is not something that you can go to someone and say, you owe me this. It's the exact opposite of any of that. It's a gift that is undeserved by the one who receives it. Sometimes we say that grace and mercy are two sides of a coin. Grace is the side where there's a gift that is undeserved by the one who receives it. The other side of the, of the coin is mercy, where someone does not receive a negative consequence that they do deserve. So here when this man approaches Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, he demonstrates his understanding that he had no basis to demand anything of Jesus. He was not coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I know you have the power to heal. You heal me. Because you can. Instead, he says, Lord, if you are willing, if you will give me this gift, 
that I don't deserve, that, I'm, that I am depending entirely upon your willingness to provide, I would ask that you make me clean. And Jesus teaches grace in two ways, in the way that he interacts with this man. The first way that he demonstrates grace and teaches us a lesson about it is he reached out his hand and touched the man. And you can almost, when, when, when Matthew writes those words, you can almost hear the crowd going, <gasps> You could almost see people recoiling. No, Jesus, don't do that. He's got leprosy. Don't, don't get too close. Don't touch him. But Jesus demonstrates the grace of God. And here is a man pleading for grace. And Jesus, who had the power... To heal him with a thought, much less a word, doesn't simply heal him with a thought or a word, but reaches out his hand and touches him. Giving this man something that he probably hadn't had in many, many years. Physical contact with another human being. And then Jesus says, I am willing. Be clean. Jesus was telling the man, I see that you understand. I see that you get it. I see that you are coming to me for God's grace. And I am willing for you to have it. I am willing to give you what, your, what my Father has empowered me to give. Now Jesus didn't present a sermon. He didn't sit down on a rock and say, I'm going to tell you all about grace today. But Jesus just taught a powerful lesson about grace. Grace. by reaching out and touching this man who desired so desperately to be healed and expressing his willingness that this man receive the thing for which he asked. The second circumstance that we see and it begins in the very next verse of Matthew's account goes like this. When Jesus had entered Capernaum a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes. And that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. Go ahead to the next slide Nathaniel. And when Jesus heard this he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. 
That word centurion is not one we encounter in everyday language, at least not in our day. But in the first century, in the society in which Jesus was living at the time, it was where the Israelite people were under the domination of the Roman Empire, centurions were people they knew and understood. The word centurion literally means one who is over a hundred. This was an individual who was a military commander who had a, a company that he was responsible for of a hundred soldiers, sometimes more than that. But the basic idea was he was the commander of a hundred soldiers. This is a man who had great importance in the, in the Roman military. And certainly not only that would have been someone who would have been very strange in coming to Jesus, a Jewish man, for assistance in anything. Because the Romans did not see the Jews as their equals, much less as people that they should want to be on the good side of. They saw them as a people they controlled. They saw them as a people essentially that they owned. And to ask a favor as a Roman from a Jewish person would have seemed ridiculous to both parties. And yet, that's exactly what happens here. And Jesus uses this occasion... to teach a lesson. But the lesson is not the lesson we might think. Because the centurion demonstrates his understanding of Jesus' authority. He twice addresses Jesus as Lord. Which again, for a Roman to address a Jew as Lord would have had the people traveling with him saying, what are you doing? This man is beneath you. And yet you address him as Lord. This man's not worthy to shine your shoes. And yet you address him as Lord. But the fact that he so addresses Jesus shows that he understood the authority Jesus had. Shows that he understood Jesus' power. And his worthiness of being addressed in such a manner. And in fact, the centurion, even though he is a person by his own account, who is very accustomed to giving orders and having them obeyed, he's very accustomed to telling people what to do. I tell somebody to go and he goes. I tell somebody to come and he comes. I tell somebody to do this and he does it. And yet, he doesn't command Jesus, a person who literally was under his command, he doesn't command Jesus to do anything. Instead, he asks a favor of him. He doesn't dare give an order to Jesus, even though he was very accustomed to giving orders. And in fact, he says that I understand what it means to be a man under authority. And what he's saying by that is not, I understand what it means as a soldier to be under a commander. What he's saying is, I understand as one who is in the presence of the Lord that I am subject to him. So all of that happens. But yet what I want us to notice is that Jesus doesn't use this as an opportunity to teach about authority. That would have seemed the logical place for him to go, wouldn't it? Here's a man who is a person of authority, but who demonstrates his subjection to Jesus' authority. Here's a man who talks about authority. Here's a man who 
demonstrates a very clear understanding of what authority is. But yet Jesus doesn't use this as an opportunity to tell a lesson about authority. Instead, Jesus uses the occasion to teach a lesson about inclusivity. Because what Jesus says in response to the centurion is, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Immediately drawing the contrast to the fact that this is not a man of Israel. This is not a man who worships the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a heathen. This is a pagan. This is a man who worships the multitude of false gods that the Romans held up and build temples to and burn offerings to and who's, who, who's Mythology informs every aspect of their culture. He is not of us, Jesus says. But I've not found anybody among us who has faith like this man has. Because you see, the religious people of Jesus' day did not call him Lord. The religious people of Jesus' day, by and large, would not have come and subjected themselves to Jesus and said, please, I need your help. I need something that I know that only you can do. I'm desperate. The religious men of Israel were not of that mind toward Jesus. But this man, who was not of their people, in fact, who was of an enemy of their people, comes to Jesus, calls him Lord, acknowledges his authority, and begs him for a favor. And Jesus takes that point in order to say this, that many will come from the east and west and take their places at the feast. The Israelite people have been very accustomed over the course of many centuries to thinking about themselves as the chosen people of God. And rightly so, for indeed they were. But Jesus wanted them to understand that God had people everywhere. And that the time was coming when that separation that then existed between God's chosen people as constituted in Israel and God's people in the world at large, that wall of separation was going away. That they were all about to be one people who acknowledge God through his son. The people will come, he says, from the east and the west. There will be people who will come from every nation. And they will have a place at the feast. Right alongside Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will be welcome in the kingdom of God. A thing that the religious people of Israel in that day would have been horrified to think about. What do you mean Romans are going to sit down in the kingdom of God? They are a godless people. Not anymore, Jesus says. Because this man has faith in me. And therefore he is welcome. While the subjects of the kingdom who resist me, who refuse to acknowledge my authority, who refuse to call me Lord, they're going to be thrown outside. And people like this man are going to take their place. Jesus uses the occasion not to talk about authority. 
even though he'd been given a perfect opening to talk about that, by the words of the centurion. Instead, Jesus uses the opportunity to talk about inclusivity. To talk about a God who would welcome all people. A God who was going to break down the barrier that separated Jew and Gentile. And make all one people. Because of faith. And then lastly, in the very next chapter, Matthew presents another circumstance to us. Jesus, he says, stepped into a boat and crossed over and came to his own town. And some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. And at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow's blaspheming. But knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier? To say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe. And they praised God who had given such authority to man. Now, Jesus is going to give a lesson about authority. Here was a man who had come to get healing for his body. Was desperate enough to have it that his friends had carried him for who knows what kind of distance in order to get him into the presence of Jesus that Jesus might heal him. And we can well understand that. If you can't walk, there is nothing in the world you want more than to be able to walk. You can imagine no greater gift that somebody could give you than to give you back the ability to stand on your own two feet and walk under your own power. But Jesus demonstrated he had a greater gift to give than that. As great as that gift was. And that greater gift was not healing of the body, but healing of the spirit. He says to the man who came to get his legs fixed, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. He had come looking for one thing, and all of a sudden something even greater is on offer. Jesus used this circumstance to teach a lesson about his greater authority. You see, it was easy for people to see that Jesus had power over physical things. He did that kind of thing all the time. People were sick. They came to Jesus, they got better. Jesus did things like, you know, turning water into wine and, you know, walking on water and, you know, all kinds of, of, of miraculous things. It was easy to see, if you hung out with Jesus long enough, that he had authority over physical things. But Jesus wanted to demonstrate. He wanted to teach a lesson about the fact that he had a greater authority than that. As great as that authority was, he had a greater authority. And that was authority over spiritual things. He said, I want you to know 
that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I am not just a person, Jesus said, who can heal the body. I can heal the spirit. And it's that more than the other that I've come to do. You know, we might ask the question, why didn't Jesus heal everybody? You know, a lot of sick people in, in Jesus' day who were afflicted by one thing or another, he didn't heal all of them. Why not? He had the power to do it. But that wasn't what Jesus came for. That wasn't his primary purpose. He used those opportunities to heal the physical body, which he did do, quite frankly, an awful lot. But he used those opportunities to support his spiritual message. To confirm the fact that he had the right to teach the things that he taught. Because he had this, this visible power. And in this circumstance, as great a thing as it was to be able to tell a man who was lying on a mat, unable to stand, to get up and walk and go home, a gr as great a thing that, as that was, the greater thing, Jesus said, is for me to tell the man that his sins are forgiven. That not just his body is healed, but his soul is healed. Because you can go to a doctor and the doctor might fix your body. There's no doctor on the planet can fix your soul. There's one doctor that can do that. And Jesus is that doctor. He wanted people to understand that his authority was greater than just what they could see. As great as what they could see was, he had something even greater to offer. And it's interesting that we can get from Matthew's account, people understood the message. Said they praised God who had given such authority to man. They praised God that there was someone among them who had now the authority to say to someone, your sins are forgiven. Because for centuries, they had lived under a law that did not provide for the forgiveness of sins. The law of Moses provided for the setting aside of sins Year by year. You know, every year you went to the priest, you offered a sacrifice. The priest said, okay, come back next year. And next year you had to come back, give another sacrifice, and your sins got pushed off again for another year. That's not forgiveness. That's just delaying the inevitable. Jesus had the power to forgive sins. And when people saw that, they praised God. That now there was someone who could do something that no one had ever been able to promise them before. Jesus used this circumstance to teach a lesson about his authority. Go ahead to the last slide, Nathaniel. Three teachings Jesus gives in the presence of his performing an act of healing. And none of those lessons are really about healing at all. He teaches a lesson about grace. To demonstrate that God is willing to heal us. Not in the physical body, but in the spirit. Through Christ, 
even though we don't deserve that gift. He taught a lesson about inclusivity. Demonstrating that that amazing grace of God is available to anyone. Anyone from any place, any people, any background. Even this Roman who comes in humble faith and names Jesus as Lord can be a subject of God's grace. And then Jesus gave a lesson about authority. Demonstrating that his visible authority, the, his power to heal the body and do other miracles, was less important than his invisible authority. His power to heal the spirit and restore it once again to a right relationship with the God who gave it. Jesus was the great physician. He had the power to heal all things. He could heal leprosy. He could heal a man who was paralyzed. He could heal all kinds of afflictions. But Jesus used that ability to teach more important lessons. Lessons about grace. A grace that is available to all. And a grace that he alone has the authority to bestow upon those who come for it. What made Jesus such a great and master teacher is that he was able to teach these amazing lessons without really teaching. We didn't see in any of these circumstances Jesus giving a dissertation about anything. And yet he taught three powerful lessons. As you go about your week this week, reflect on these three things. Reflect on the grace of God through Christ. Reflect on the fact that God is willing through His Son to give you something you don't deserve. Which is the healing of your spirit. The forgiveness of your sins. The promise in Him of eternal life. Reflect on the fact that our God is an inclusive God. God doesn't care who you are, doesn't care where you come from, doesn't care who your people are, doesn't care what color your skin is, doesn't care what nationality is on your passport. God cares about one thing. Do you come to Him in faith, believing that He is God and that Jesus is His Son? who died for you. Because if you come to him with that faith, you, whoever you are, can receive the grace that Jesus came to offer. And reflect on the authority of Jesus. Reflect on the fact that he alone has the authority to extend God's grace to you. Nobody else can do that. Doctors can heal your body, but no one can heal your spirit but Jesus alone. And He's willing. I am willing, He said. He's willing to give you that gift if you come to Him knowing that He is the giver. Think about those things this week, and I hope those thoughts bless you. Let's stand and we'll sing the song that Nathaniel's chosen.